Welcome into a bonus edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young, Drew Galloway, all three of us here together, ready to bring you some bi week content. You know, normally on a Thursday, you go to the K State Online YouTube page and you're loaded up on coordinator press conference stuff from Colin Klein and Joe Klanderman. Not today. Uh, I'm sure you're sad you don't get to hear or see either of those fine-looking men, uh, but instead you get the three of us, and uh, we are here to explain ourselves a little bit more. Every Wednesday, you see our Big 12 Power Rankings. You get the aggregate of how things work out with the three of us putting together our rankings, but you really only get my voice in it, so you don't get to hear the explanations from D.Y. or Drew, because I'm sure over the last two weeks, everybody's wondering, what does D.Y. see in TCU that makes him think they're better than K-State right now? Uh, we'll get to that. There are also some other things within the rankings that are probably uh, worth mentioning and kind of dissecting. I want to point out that I was the first adopter on Oklahoma State being the worst team in the Big 12, uh, despite the fact that it took you know three weeks of the season for me to actually get there. But I do truly believe that now, uh, that Oklahoma State is, is uh, the worst team in the league. And uh, I've I've gotten Drew to convert or DY to convert. Drew's still holding out hope that Mike Gundy has a little bit of magic left in that hat. So uh, we'll we'll break it all down for you. And really, uh, the thing that we've already determined before we started recording today, the most anticipated part of the show is going to be at the end when we try to determine which group of five league the worst four teams in the Big Twelve could win. Um, it's it is not looking good for a lot of these teams on if they could win like the Mac or the Mountain West or something. Uh, it seems like that they might be in a tricky spot. So without further ado, let's dive on into the rankings. Uh, I'll flash them up on the screen if you're watching on the YouTube for the first time. Texas, a unanimous number one for all three of us. And it's very clear that the Longhorns are in a tier of their own. It, it's the Texas tier, and it's a one-man band right now. Everybody else falls in line behind them. I'll let you uh, start things off here, D.Y. What I mean, what is it about this Texas team that at least feels different than teams in past years where they would have already had a bad loss and let everybody down? That's probably what's different, right? Because they haven't had that bad loss. Maybe a little bit of a slow start to Wyoming is the only complaint right now. Through three quarters, slept walk there, still won, I think, by four touchdowns. So that tells you the kind of firepower that they still have. But at the end of the day, you have to like – the growth and maturation that you've seen from Quinn Ewer so far, because he's, he just looks like he's more comfortable in his own skin and he's not kind of that problem child that he was, you know, remember he had that, he was supposed to be a high school senior and instead he was in Columbus playing for Ohio state on the bench, but he would, I mean, he went to college a year before he was supposed to go to college. So we're seeing a guy probably grow up right before our eyes and you combine that with what could be, what, one of the top five defenses in the entire country. I mean, yeah. one of my, spoiler alert, one of my better bets this week will be probably KU, their total point under. I think it'll probably sit around 24, 25. I haven't looked at it yet, but I think the Jayhawks are going to struggle to score against Texas. Well, I mean, you think about KU, they, they scored 38 against BYU, but 14 of it came from their defense. So um, now, again, some of that is the offense didn't have as many possessions to score, but you only get 24 points out of your offense. So, yeah, something to, to consider there. Uh, Drew, what have, what have been your takeaways early on the Longhorns this year and why they're so far ahead, I think, of the rest of the Big 12? I think D.Y. kind of hit it on the head. It's like they're, they're just taking care of business. Like last Saturday was just a ho-hum 38-6 to drubbing at Baylor, who is one of the bottom four teams. They never struggled. It didn't look like the game ever could have, like Baylor didn't have a chance. And they played like, what, they played half of a bad game against Wyoming. Maybe you could say three quarters. Uh, and that that's it. Like they they took care of business against Rice. They played Alabama extremely well. They were more physical than Alabama. Like they, there's just a different aura around this Texas team. And then you look at like their schedule, and the, the schedule isn't great. So it, it's really set up for Texas to be in a tier of their own. Yeah, yeah. They if they don't win the Big Twelve. They really royally screwed the pooch this year, is what I would say, because they are you know, head and shoulders above the rest of the league. I'll put it this way. 
people want to poo-poo a little bit on their win over Alabama. And I, I get it to an extent. But is there another team in the Big 12 that you would say would beat Alabama in Tuscaloosa right now? No. 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 Still no. So And – the 34 points they scored on that Alabama defense is still very real. I mean, that's the one thing that everybody keeps saying, hey, Alabama defensively has not changed that much. It's the offense that's really struggling, and more specifically quarterback. I mean, and the one thing to me that really stood out with how things have changed for Texas this past week specifically is the fact that Jonathan Brooks now had this major breakout where I think early on you were thinking, okay, they lose B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson. The run game won't be the same. That obviously was Texas's biggest strength last year. You could tell when the game would flip, when it became Quinn Ewer's time to throw the ball a lot more, Texas just didn't have it. They looked like a totally different team and it was all on the run game. Now they have the run game to go with an improved Quinn Ewers and their receiving room is better this year too. Cause they've added Adonai Mitchell uh, in with you know an already good room with Whittington and Worthy. So, I mean, they, they are a very complete team right now. I mean, you take a, a top five defense like DY is suggesting and put it with an offense that, you know, even if the pieces don't fully come together and they don't reach their full potential, that's still an offense that's probably going to end up being top 15, top 20 in the country, at least you would uh, assume based off of the talent there. So they are the real deal, and it, it's it's a legitimate Texas team. Like you have not seen a Texas team like this since you know before Mac Brown started going downhill in Austin. Like this is the type of team that that matches up with them. And they have the second best offensive lineman in the Big Twelve too, and Kelvin Banks. I mean, they are complete. Yeah, they're uh, they're in a good spot. All right, so then once you get past Texas, everybody else has either shown some warts or at least has been on the brink where you can kind of say. I can see I can see where the holes in your team are right now. Um, Oklahoma, their hole basically is don't make us play a good team. Uh, if you make us play anybody that could flirt with being above 500, we might mess up. Uh, they tried to against Cincinnati. I'm shocked that they only were able to score 20. It was 20 to six. And by the way, in that game, I you know I wrote it uh, for the the power rankings piece that will go up on the the site, but. Cincinnati had the ball four times inside the Oklahoma 30 on Saturday and didn't score points. Uh, that's that's not a good outcome there, and, and still Cincinnati uh, lost by only 14. Then K-State, obviously, we've talked about it a lot. We know where their issues fall. The secondary is still trying to come along. Early offensive line and run game struggles. Now that seems to be obviously in a better spot after the week DJ Giddens had, but you're still kind of hoping that the receivers and Will Howard can connect a little bit better. K-State's close. They are very close, but they still have a lot to get going. And then Kansas and TCU, probably two teams that are in kind of similar boats. Both offenses seem like they're just as good as anybody in the Big 12. It's the defense that is going to be the question mark for those sides because we saw TCU give up 45 to Colorado to start the year. Obviously, KU still has some holes on their defense, even though they were able to kind of save some of it with some big plays that turned into touchdowns for them. Uh, over the weekend against BYU. So I am I right to to include those teams only in the middle tier, or would you even kick UCF in there with uh, the, the second grouping that are all basically playing for second place and a trip to Arlington with Texas? No, well, I would just go those four. I, it's, I think some people want to go UCF there, but for me it's OU, K-State, KU, and TCU. And I don't if UCF was close, they don't lose by 20, even with their backup quarterback to K-State. And I know I say 20 because it was 20. I mean, Gus Malzahn's, not, Gus Malzahn's not fooling me. Um, they do get John Rice Plumley back. Does that change it a little bit? For me, no. I, I think there's still a leg below those four. And I know personally with those four, I, I, I have Oklahoma too almost as a default still. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because they've been the most important aggressive probably but we just don't know enough one way or the other about them but i probably viewed their win over cincinnati as more of a negative than a positive even though i did keep them at two for me i still have tcu over both k-state and ku the loss to colorado since they had travis hunter at the time certainly doesn't look nearly as bad in fact maybe it's good you only lost by what a couple points and it was right there in colorado that could be seen as good and I thought they had one of the better performances last week. I mean, they just slapped around SMU like they were yeah. uh, Louisiana Tech. So 
I, I like to, I, I just think TCU's body of work probably is a hair better than both K State or K, um, KU. K State has the loss to Missouri that they probably should have won. Um, and I and I think Colorado is better than Missouri when Colorado is at full strength. If I had to guess, now Colorado might not have this same defense, but that offense. I mean, Missouri doesn't have Shadur Sanders and that offense yeah. clicking with mm-hmm. the same kind of power power. So I, that's why I would lean towards Colorado being better than Missouri um, when they do have Travis Hunter. You have Shadur Sanders, Travis Hunter on offense. That, that's tough to uh, negate. The TCU blasted SMU. I thought that was a really impressive win to. To be quite honest, uh, they took care of Houston with relative ease, and then KU they you know they kind of played with their food in the second half against Illinois. They definitely played with their food against <laughs> Nevada. Kansas State lost to Missouri. Um, yeah, I just think TCU's body of work is a hair better than K State or KU. Yeah, the, the second tier is just, or the second tier of the Big Twelve is just really flawed like they're all teams that you could see okay if everything goes right like they they could easily get to arlington but nobody has really played probably their best game against a a good team like oklahoma yeah they beat arkansas state 73 nothing and then handle and then beat the crap out of tulsa but like the two teams that they've played with a pulse they've kind of struggled a little bit and you could say that in a way they were kind of outplayed by Cincinnati. Yeah. Using my, using that logic, which is correct against myself, you could probably make a case TCU should be ahead of Oklahoma. If I used to apply the same perspective there. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think I'm comfortable with, with keeping K state above TCU right now. Number one, cause I just, I still believe that K state is better than TCU uh, as currently constructed. And I think that, it, you know, you look around like, so TCU's best win, is it SMU or Houston? I think UCF is better than either of those two, so I think K-State probably has the better win out of them. And then the losses, you're right, Colorado's a better team than Missouri, or at least the Colorado team that TCU saw was. But, and and, you know, you can kind of look at it this way, like K-State lost that game on the road. Colorado was on the road in Fort Worth when they they beat TCU. So TCU lost a home game by a field goal. K-State lost a road game by a field goal. It probably cancels out uh, who's marginally better. And honestly, like, that's the kind of game that matches up well for TCU because TCU is probably going to give up points anyways, no matter who they played. Uh, They just played a team with a good offense, so they could put them out of their misery a lot quicker on defense and just score like that. Uh, So I don't know. I, I think... I think any of those you could make a legitimate case right now on why they should be number three behind Oklahoma. I mean, even Kansas has the argument to say, hey, we're 4-0. You know, the offenses look good still, um, but we know the history of Kansas, and that's going to be tough to get over. And also just yeah. the fact that the defense is is clearly, even though there are some numbers that suggest that the, the defense is improved, you can still see it. I mean, Illinois – killed themselves by not running the ball more because it was there. They got away from it, though, and felt like they needed to throw it. When they started running more in the second half is when they got back into the game. And things have worked out to this point. I think they're converting like 60% of their third downs, which is kind of crazy. But they also haven't played anybody that I'm overwhelmed by. I mean, Illinois just struggled to beat a group of five school uh, this past week, and they had to hang on to get it done. And then – or I guess it was the weekend before – and then you kind of look around at some of the other outcomes that that have gone on. Like, I just I think that there's there's obvious holes, and there's still teams that are trying to get it figured out. And I, if I had to pick a team right now out of those three, I think K State is still probably playing better than all of them. I, we're just so close to it, and everybody wants to think the sky's falling because this isn't a team that's as good as last year's. You said that uh, you said that you thought that Illinois threw too much. Keaton Slovis threw it 51 times last weekend. Yeah. Not not great. Not a recipe for success. Yeah, I would. I mean, I can't you know, push back on that too much. And and I think you're kind of we're probably kind of quibbling. Mm-hmm. For me, with the KU thing, the reason why I was a little out on them more than the other three, I couldn't get over the Nevada game. Yeah, it's bad. I mean, Nevada is legitimately Terrible. one of the worst, if not the worst, school in, in FBS right now. Um and I mean, I, I think it, and also it's, we shouldn't forget that like, okay, you really struggled with Missouri state. That was a, that was a 10 point game early in the fourth quarter to start the year. Then KU eventually kind of turned it on and, and got it going. I, you know, I, I think KU has obviously improved and I do be- truly believe that 
based on this year's league, they are in the second tier of teams currently. Uh, and their schedule might work out favorably for them as a lot of these teams are probably looking around. It's going to come down to how your schedule looks since you don't play everybody this year. But I would also say some of the criticisms that people have of Will Howard right now, at least in you know K-State land, on some of the balls that he is throwing, Jalen Daniels does a lot of similar things to him. And he's, to this point in the season, kind of been bailed out and lucked out with it. And I, I talked about this uh, earlier in the week when I, I was kind of going through and looking at the sizes of receivers. One thing that also helps Jalen Daniels when he can do it, and this is the freedom for him to do it, He's got the second biggest receivers in the Big 12. Will Howard has the shortest ones. So there's a lot more, well, not a lot more, but there is more room for air on some of those throws, and guys are more apt to go up and get one for him. Um, but, you know, flaws flaws are everywhere for, for these teams in the next tier, and they're the type of teams that probably if they lose to the bottom four, we would be shocked, but if they lost to anybody else, you could probably go through and pinpoint exactly how it happened. So moving beyond that, then we get into this next here with UCF, BYU, West Virginia, and then you, you you could make the argument that Texas Tech and Cincinnati don't deserve to be there, but they've probably done enough to differentiate themselves from the very clear bottom four of the Big 12 right now. Uh, Drew, I'll let you lead off here. What, what stands out to you about these four or five teams uh, in the middle of the league that are probably going to beat up on the, the worst teams, but also struggle similar to what we saw with UCF and BYU to finish things off against teams in the tier above them. I mean, to, to be honest, I think the stand, the thing that really stands out about this middle, this really, I guess it is a middle tier is that Texas tech is in it. I mean, it, all off season, everybody kind of was on the hype train of, Oh, like Texas tech is a dark horse to get to Arlington. And then they start off stubbing their toe against Wyoming. And then they probably outplayed Oregon for a lot of the game and then lost it on some coaching decisions. And then you lose to West Virginia and then lose your quarterback. It, it's there. It was the recipe for everything that could go wrong has felt like it's gone wrong right now for Texas tech. And it feels like that they're the team that is kind of the, the real underachiever so far in, in the league this year. And it's more surprising to me that they're in this tier than that any of the other teams were in here. If you told me before the season, okay, like this is going to be what the six through like 10 looks like. I would have been surprised if I would have saw a text tech in that. I would have too. What I will say is like, what's Texas tech's next two games, Baylor and Houston. Yeah. Yeah. Baylor and Houston. They're, they'll probably be like, they're probably climbing out of this tier pretty quickly. If, if they figured out just even a little bit. Um, so that, that would be one of my, uh, my takeaways from this group is like Texas tech got a comforting schedule ahead. The other observation is like techs in here probably fall into this tier partially because you lost your quarterback. Right. I would say UCF has fallen to this tier partially because they lost their quarterback. West Virginia lost their quarterback and they got up here. So, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe you're, you just you tip your cap to West Virginia a little bit, right? Yeah. Oh, I think so. I mean, West Virginia I was pretty much like a unanimous agreement. They were going to finish either 13th or 14th in the Big 12 this year. And they have only played one Big 12 game. It's obviously against a team that's reeling. But the fact that they are 3-1 and one right now, and I mean, I, I think – we looked at it earlier in the week, but you look at their schedule, it's hard not to see West Virginia getting to at least six wins. And you can look around and find, you know, maybe seven on there. Like, and again, they're probably not good enough to probably, you know, actually come through on that and they'll shoot themselves in the foot a couple times. But it is impressive what they've done to, to stick around and hang up here. Um, and everybody else in this tier, at least to me, BYU is going to hang on to the credit they're going to get from that Arkansas win for a little bit, but that's the team that could drop like a rock rather quickly. Cause I've thought all year long that I I'm not a big believer in BYU. Um, we'll see. I mean, there's a reason why Keaton Slovis is on what is third different school now, uh, similar to JT Daniels. Like there, there's a reason why those guys are not lasting at places they've gone to. And you look around at, at what else could happen. Like they could easily lose to just about anybody else. Like Cincinnati goes to Provo this weekend. Cincinnati could win that game. We'll, we'll have to see what comes about in it. So 
this is just a tier of teams that either like you could pick two of them, they could move up. You could pick two of them, they could move down. It's uh it's a pretty easy thing to see. Um, it's just about how is the quarterback play going to be? It's a question with basically all of those schools there, whether it's due to injury or just talent. <laughs> yeah, because the ones the ones that haven't been injured are what Keegan Slovis and Emory Jones. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I will I what I will say is the way you feel about BYU, I kind of feel that way about Cincinnati. Like those mm-hmm. dudes lost to Miami, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. We should have yeah. listened to Neil Brown at a Big 12 Media Days because he was adamant that they weren't going to finish last. I guess here. he he must have looked around the league and said, yeah, I, I, I we're going to finish last to these clowns? No way. <laughs> yeah, dude, Neil Brown. Uh, you know what? He is a good dude, so I'm kind of glad that he's – even if this is his last hurrah in Morgantown, that it's not like a disaster. Yeah, yeah. good for him. He, yeah. I, I thought that he would be like – out of out the door by Halloween. Now we we talked about this. I think Mason, like we did. You, you remember it is similar to like when Texas Tech, they really wanted Matt Wells out, right? Mm-hmm. They really wanted Matt Wells out, and they were kind of winning. They're like, oh crap, we can't get Matt Wells out. So they just picked like this random loss. Is like this is nope. That's what uh, broke the back, which ended up being the Kansas State game, actually. So at what point does West Virginia get a little like paranoid and just like, you know what, this five and two, five and three records, not cutting it. Got to, got to, got to can them. Yeah. I think, I think it's that game, depending on how things go, it could be that road trip to Norman where it's the, it's the 10th game of the year. And if they get like just torched, it's like, yeah, we're not going to ever like whatever, move on from this. So uh, that's probably where they could find their out and do it, but we'll have to see. All right. So, Cincinnati, there's a little bit of, you know, could they be in this second tier? Could they not be? Uh, but then, yeah, they, they might, it might be a bottom five. Like Cincinnati's yes. barely in that middle tier. Uh, and then, I mean, the, here's the problem Cincinnati is splitting hairs. BYU could get there. West Virginia probably deserved to be there at the start of the year. If you are one of the four teams that is in this def- defined bottom tier, something has gone horribly wrong with your season or if you're Houston we knew you were going to be this bad this year uh so I mean take your pick guys which of these four is the worst because we all have different ideas on it obviously I'm on record with Oklahoma State DY's kind of converted that maybe it's just by how they've played um but I'll I'll let Drew kind of start off with his thought real quick who's the worst team of these four uh so my my bottom team right now is Baylor just because uh, the loss of Texas State to start the year, not great. They they got great. they weren't competitive against Texas. the The Utah loss is the Utah loss is probably their best game that they've played. So, <laughs> so, so it's like that. and Utah doesn't score. I mean, yeah. you know, Utah won fourteen to seven this weekend against UCLA, and seven of those came from their defense. So, so because because of that, I think Baylor's the the worst team because the, their best game was a loss. Yeah, look, who are Houston's losses to TCU and Rice? Rice, which Rice is not like actually not awful. Uh, JT Daniels like top ten passing yeah. in the country right now. He's yeah. finally playing well, like he was supposed to. Well, when yeah, you're forty so, years old, are you really? But, but you shouldn't be losing twenty eight to nothing at one point. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. Like they were they were getting freaking housed by Rice at one point. Look, I, here's what I will say. We can quibble over who's the worst, but I think it's probably three that are the worst. Because Iowa State, you kind of have to put in their own tier, kind of like Texas. Like we're definitely eleventh. I think. I think <laughs> if for Iowa State, 11. because we beat one of those three schools, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. I well, I mean, I don't know. Baylor's the one that I guess I maybe still hold out some hope for because I just feel like they can't be this bad, even though like I'm not a Dave Aranda guy. I've, I've but, said plenty of times I think he's a, a fraud, but it, I mean, they may just not be good this year. But as lo- I think losing the Texas State, basically what's worse, losing Ohio or losing the Texas State? I would say losing the Texas State because they weren't, I think they got their butts kicked, right? 
I mean, it, it wasn't competitive yeah. for a, a lot of the game. You know, Ohio, yeah, I mean, you know, Ohio's a solid team. In the yeah, and, I mean, Ohio is going to dominate the MAC. It looks like this year. I mean, they started off conference play with a thirty-eight to seven win over Bowling Green on the road. Road dogs, Ohio. So maybe, uh, maybe you're right about that. I, I don't Ohio, know. I think, Ohio, Toledo, and Central Michigan, I think, are probably your best MAC teams. I want to say. Yeah, a, a Texas State. Uh, from what I just looked at, they're 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 three and one right now. Their only loss is the UTSA, but we kind of think UTSA is bad this year. Houston beat UTSA. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a paradox here. I I don't know. <laughs> Transitive property is not helping me out whatsoever. I like Iowa. I like goes. I like Iowa State more than those other three. I think they. I would agree themselves. Iowa, Iowa State, State at least has, has. Yeah, go ahead. The Iowa State has hope. The, I don't think the other three have a lot. Yeah. Of Hope is hope is. Uh, I wouldn't say they have hope, but they have a defense <laughs> that's at least better than some others. Although uh, I heard they did give they, up heard, twenty-seven. I heard they got a coach on the hot seat. <laughs> oh well, I, you better wait until you get a knock on your door. It's probably Matt Campbell coming to punch you in the face. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just bad, and I mean, obviously, the Oklahoma State thing is a, a totally different deal. Um, I, I wins don't even look good. No, no, because no. the Arizona State road win, like Arizona State, they're probably the worst Power Five team out there, right? Like yeah. at least yeah. in the conversation, despite the fact that USC let them uh, hang around, because Arizona State's just not very good the way they're playing right now. So I think Oklahoma State is the worst team in the league. That's why over the pretty much since the season started, that game in Stillwater hasn't alarmed me for K State. Um, Cause I just don't know that Oklahoma state has much fight in them. And you look at like, what is there on that roster? The quarterback situation, I think is indicative of the Mike Gundy situation, which is the guys that are there right now, they're just there because they wanted a chance and an opportunity to play in what they thought was like a respectable team and in a, in a good league. Um, but Alan Bowman is your starting quarterback. Like nobody else wanted to be there would be my assumption because how, how could Oklahoma state, go through a time when the transfer portal is as big and bad as possible. And there are all these other names that entered it that other schools ended up with. And the best you can do is Alan Bowman. I just think guys don't want to be in Stillwater right now. They had a bunch of dudes leave there. Um, like I think Mike Gundy is going to get cannibalized by the way that the world and college football is operating at this point in time. And he, I mean, he either needs to change something quick and prove me wrong or I really do think over the next couple of weeks, there are probably going to have to be some hard conversations in Stillwater. Like, okay, what does this look like when we have to to negotiate getting away from Mike Gundy? I mean, it honestly, will that situation be nastier than what K State had to try and navigate with, you know, shoe and bill to the side in 2018? Because the difference being Mike Gundy is obviously a younger person that is much more apt to fight very hard and very loudly based off the way that he has done things in the past. Like I think this could get very publicly nasty for Oklahoma state. If they have to move off of Gundy, it could when that time comes, but even if they go four and eight, five and seven this year, I don't, I, th- I don't you think, think they're, they're good enough to do, to get to that. The schedule is bad, but I don't know if they're good. They, they do have one of the weaker Big 12 schedules. I, I look, I'd be surprised that they win less than four games. So they could at least get the four and eight, um, maybe five and seven. I don't know. But if you're even at the worst case, with, in my opinion, four and eight, like he was a half yard away from making a playoff two years ago. Yeah. So I just don't think those conversations are happening yet. Yeah. I mean, you look at the schedule. Their next two games are K-State and KU, both at home, but you would think that K-State and KU will both be probably considerable favorites in those games. Uh, So losses there. But then at West Virginia, you could be kind and call it a toss-up. We'll see how West Virginia's playing in a couple weeks when that game happens. But that's probably one right now that you think road game, Morgantown, West Virginia handles. I mean, if if West Virginia was just able to beat Texas Tech, they can probably do it with O-State. And then... Cincinnati at home, winnable game. Oklahoma is going to wax them this year. That's going to be just another like disgusting bedlam game that, you know, it's you're going to get the number of like how many times Oklahoma State has actually won that game and you're surprised or, it's that low. Or, or this is first, this is like a <laughs> stupid like yes. here and it's the one time they actually rise up and actually compete well and, <laughs> and have a chance to win. And it is the last one. 
Yeah, true. Uh, road trip to UCF, that'll be a loss. At Houston, they could win that, and then home against BYU. So they do at least have some home games that are winnable. We'll see. But I, I right now, as they're constructed, they are the absolute worst. Um, okay, go ahead, uh, and then we'll move on to, to uh, the fun here. I would, I would say they'll they should be shooting for a bowl because it's probably nothing better. Like six wins, maybe. Can you I, think, I think if you get to six wins, you've had a miracle season. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's that's how I see it right now for that team. Okay, looking around, we talked about the defined bottom four. They aren't very good. Uh, you can pick whichever team you want, but which league could these four produce a champion out of? Like, what is the group of five league that they could actually win? Because the options are obviously the American. Um, the American is going to be a sneaky, not very good league anymore with what but, they lost and what's there. Man- I mean – but I don't know, if, like Memphis just hang hung with Missouri. Yeah. So uh, Memphis is probably Memphis and SMU might be your best Tulane's in that league right now. Tulane's pretty solid too. Yeah, Tulane. What? Yeah, that's right. I should. Well, Memphis, I I Memphis, Memphis and Tulane can beat those four. I think. Okay. All right. So then, uh, not the American. You go down the list. You get to Conference USA. This is the one that we've pegged as possibly this being is the one, the one to win. Um, you'd have they- to beat Liberty who's 4-0, uh, but the Flames haven't really played anybody this Look, year. I, I, Iowa State can win the Conference USA. Yes. Um, okay. the Conference Baylor, USA. I would say Baylor can win Conference USA. I am not sure about the other two. Uh, I mean, could BYU and Houston? Sam Houston's in, in the Conference USA, and they've got wins there, although Sam Houston is 0-3, so not very good. Yeah. But. Conference USA has nine teams and two were in the FCS last year. I'd say that – I'd say this Iowa is the State one, definitely but do it. Are all four of these teams capable of beating Liberty? I don't. Mm, I don't know. I as the way Oklahoma State is playing right now, I do not think so. Um, Houston I mean, would probably be in a dogfight at this point. I mean, the other two, I think, could do it. Well, I should say league, that about Baylor, league, but what league is uh, South Alabama? In? Uh, they're in the Sun Belt. Sun Belt. Okay, because you got to remember they beat Oklahoma State in Stillwater by almost four <laughs> touchdowns. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, look, I don't think they're winning the Sun Belt because uh, <laughs> Georgia State is having a great year. Uh, James Madison is, uh, has done great since moving up. Georgia Southern, uh, they were receiving votes for the first time in however long. I saw that that was a big deal. Uh, uh, Marshall, and Marshall beat uh, Virginia Tech. Yeah, is really bad. And Texas yeah. State is in, is in there too, and they've got a Big 12 win this year. So uh, yeah, these teams – I don't think they're doing App State, you know, the down year for them. Coastal Carolina also down, but that I don't know. It would probably make for compelling TV if these teams were in, in the Sun Belt this year. They could maybe yeah. compete for a spot in the conference title game. South Alabama, you know, they they whipped up on the Cowboys, the Pokes, by 26 in Stillwater, go next week and lose to Central Michigan. Uh, I would imagine we would all agree that none of these teams would win the Mountain West. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, no shot. Because they've got a handful of solid teams this year. I mean, Air Force, Fresno. And you, you, and the two best are probably Air Force and Fresno. Yeah, yeah. Fresno is might be the G5. Uh, San Diego State's down. New York Six game. Yeah. And, you know, Boise, they, they played UCF close, but they got waxed by Washington. But that can happen to you uh, with this Washington team. Wyoming's got a Big 12 win under their belts. They hung with Texas for three quarters. So uh, we know that. And then the MAC was brought up in our pre-show discussion about could somebody of these four win the MAC? But Iowa State's oh. already lost to Ohio, so we know that that can't happen. Miami already has a Big 12 win. They beat Cincinnati, so oh, I'm not so sure. And Toledo, Toledo almost beat Toledo Illinois. Lost. Toledo beat Illinois. No, they lost, right? Yeah, they lost. Yeah, they just barely lost. So I don't know if I – yeah. You got to think, like, these MAC teams – you get to play a MAC schedule week in, week out, so maybe it helps you. Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe it does. Maybe we're, we we aren't grading it on a curve enough. But, yeah, maybe. I mean, the point, the point in all of this is the bottom four are legitimately – awful teams right now the way that they're playing and i mean i I keep repeating it people are probably sick of hearing me here and you know hearing me say it but like the big 12 has 14 teams this year and this is the least amount of good teams they've ever had and honestly it's probably the least amount of like average teams they've had because as we've talked here 
would you you probably would cut it off after UCF right now, where you feel like those are teams that are average or above average in college football as it sits right now. Because BYU, I just I, I know I get they have the win in Arkansas, but I just don't believe. I think you got to I think you got to include BYU because they have beaten a solid SEC team. I think you have to include West Virginia because they beat Pitt and Texas Tech. And yeah. I think you have to include Texas Tech because they're talented enough. I, I I would say that there's nine. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't I include know. Cincinnati though. Yeah, Cincinnati's the one that I mean they've showed a lot more fight and and which, you know which, have gotten up than I expected, but that's which, probably going to be something that falls apart rather soon. For us to not want to include Cincinnati, that's a bad look for Oklahoma because yeah, yeah, because uh, Cincinnati is a bad red zone offense team away from beating Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. we we've all said it at various points, but we knew that this would be the case with Oklahoma. They'll beat the the bad teams. We right. won't know what <laughs> Oklahoma really is because they get Iowa State at home this weekend. So we're going to be waiting until next weekend when Oklahoma and Texas play because, I mean, think about last year how it played out for Oklahoma. Texas killed Oklahoma last year, and that was a normal, hey, we're Texas, we got talent, but we're going to crap the bet against three or four teams in the season. This Texas team might be a lot different. Like, it could be back-to-back brutal years at the Cotton Bowl for Oklahoma against Texas. Yeah, I don't know that it'll be as bad as last year because it's really hard to be as bad as last year. What was the final score? 49 nothing, 56 nothing, something like it. It was yeah. pretty rough. I think something it was 49 nothing. Like uh, it was, let's see. Yeah, 49 nothing. Like, I doubt it's 49 nothing. But if you ask me how that game's going to unfold, I'm still saying Texas whips Oklahoma pretty good again. 49 nothing and Davis Bevel, never forget. Uh, the leading passer in that game for Oklahoma. He threw for a game high 38 yards. Oof. So, and also a very indicative sign of how the day went for Oklahoma. Their leading rusher in the game was Jaleel Farouk, who is their receiver. Uh, so, not only did they struggle at quarterback, they didn't. They struggled at running the ball as well in that game, and not great for for Oklahoma there. Uh, how things played out, and we'll see. I mean, I just I, I don't I don't fully buy in yet. I like Dylan Gabriel more than some, and I like the the weapons around him. But I'm I was a little surprised they only scored twenty on Cincinnati, and I don't think that's indicative of Oklahoma's defense has all of a sudden turned the corner. So, I guess we'll see. And this is a this is a good temperature check moment. I mean, we are a third of the way through the Big Twelve season. I'll ask both of you. I mean, obviously we have our Big Twelve power rankings, but they are power rankings. They will change and. They are not necessarily how we feel the season will finally play out. Uh, if you had a pick today, Drew, who's playing in Arlington first weekend in December? Oh, God. Oh. Um, <laughs> I think it's got to be Texas, Oklahoma, I, I guess, because Oklahoma's schedule is not great. Texas's schedule is pretty bad. Texas is in a tier of their own. So I feel like it's got to be those two at, at this point. Texas, Oklahoma, just because, you know, Oklahoma can beat up on bad teams and their schedule is bad teams. So, I, like, I don't think Kansas State and TCU are dom- or KU are dominant enough to, with their schedules, to do what Oklahoma will do to a bad schedule. Yeah, I mean, you're probably right about that. You Oklahoma's schedule after that game with Texas, which will probably be a loss, but you can handle one loss, it's going to come down to – UCF at home and then at Kansas are probably their toughest games uh, left. They'll play TCU uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving. Um, So maybe that could trip them up, but they're not losing in Stillwater this year. They probably won't lose in Provo. And then they have a home game with West Virginia. Like they're just. KU could play spoiler. Yeah, I think so. You're right. And I will say this. I mean, that road game to Lawrence, that's one that I've had pegged. I've said since the schedules came out, Oklahoma is losing that game. I, you, you think I about these teams that need that need something when they're building a program and trying to get to a certain point. They're, every one of them has like this signature win. So I mean, go through. Think about Matt Campbell and Iowa State before they really ascended and became what they became. They had that win against Oklahoma. Chris Kleiman got his win against Oklahoma. I guess it's a trend. I guess Oklahoma <laughs> just flat sucks. Um, and I mean, I can't remember, but like, sorry to bring this up, D.Y., but like at Purdue. 
they got that win against Ohio State on a Saturday night that was a big deal, and they turned into a, a solid program after that point. Um, teams just always seem to have that game that you point out and say, okay, they this is this is a big moment. This is a seminal moment for this program. And I really think, like, in the booth, KU Oklahoma, that will be like slaying the dragon because KU has the win against Texas, but that's Texas. You know, like, they're kind of a laughing stock this – this, despite being like seven, eight wins every year, and Oklahoma was, would be different. And that was a different KU team. They still weren't good yet. Yeah, they that was a terrible fluke KU yeah. win. Yeah. They were did it on the road. Jared Casey catches a touchdown. Like uh, no one even knew who he was at the time. That that was more of a fluke. My response in general was going to say, better OU than us. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That is very true. That is very true. It, it, it would be the same appropriate if it was K-State. Yeah. 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 No, you're right. You're right. That's that's true. Either one of those wins is going to be indicative of okay, the like we know that the Leipold thing is for real, but now it's the arrival of they can they are capable of beating these teams. Unless they beat Texas again this week, but I don't yeah, see. True. I, and they I, get it out of the way. Which at that point, then it starts setting up for maybe Oklahoma can win next weekend, and maybe this Texas team is no different than what we've known from other Texas teams over the last decade. Okay, here here's a good question: Are either Texas or Oklahoma vulnerable this weekend because they're looking ahead to the Red River Shootout the following week? Probably Oklahoma more than Texas. Uh, I think. I mean, Texas is playing the by far yeah. the. Best. Team. I yeah, think Texas the problem, is a legitimate team. I think the the I think I would say Oklahoma because if you look at what happened this weekend, Oklahoma did not score a lot against Cincinnati. Iowa State's got a better defense than Cincinnati does, and Iowa State for the first time all year is going to have offensive momentum. I mean, Rocco Beck actually played a great game. He threw for three touchdowns over 300 yards. Like they might actually feel something now, and I, I think. Th- even if KU is down for the fight, like the things that they're bad at though, like defensively, you're going to still give up some points and the Texas defense probably isn't going to have an off enough day to get um, beat to shreds and not hang around. I mean, that's not me saying that KU can't win that game. I just do think that it's probably more likely that OU were to lose, especially because they're probably the team more likely to be looking ahead right now because they got their butts kicked last year. They probably think, yeah, we're better than this Iowa State team, whatever. I think, I mean, say what you will about Steve Sarkeesian, and I've said some bad things about him in the past. I do think this year he has them focused and to the point where they're not going to do something like overlook KU because they realize how important every single game is this year because in past years they haven't treated every game of equal importance, and it's cost them dearly. Texas is a 17-point favorite. Oklahoma's a 20-point favorite. Just pointing that out. Um, I think I agree that it's Oklahoma that's probably more vulnerable just because they are the team that we'd be more likely to look at based on what happened last year. And Matt Campbell, not that this is a pressure-packed game for his job. It's, it's not. But he's running out of capital. So I think this could be, you know, a pretty critical game for him and maybe earning back a little bit of trust in that fan base. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. All right. Uh, any any final thoughts on the the state of the Big 12 right now or what's coming up? Oh, by the way, I looked, D.Y., uh, the uh, total points for KU this weekend is 22 and a half. Ooh, that is low. Yeah. So... Those guys in Vegas must be good at their jobs. They're not going to let anything get past them. They're the, they didn't, they're like, no, DY's not getting yep. this, uh, you know, because tw- 22 is a weird number. So they get 23 probably. I thought it'd be 24 and a half, and I was going to jump all over that. Um, I don't know if I like 22 and a half. That's, yeah, that's not um, a lot of points. Yeah, no, not a lot at all. All right, well, that will do it for us. D.Y. and I will be back tomorrow with a uh, normal you know, Friday show, aside from the fact that we won't have a K-State game to talk about, but we will go over all the Big 12 games this weekend. We'll give our best bets still and uh, obviously have a little bit about the Cats in there to get everybody fired up because uh, it's 
weird to say, but it'll be a Friday and we'll be exactly a week away from the next game. Uh, K-State, Oklahoma State on a Friday. Uh, the first taste of Big 12 action on a Friday, though, starts this weekend. Oklahoma, uh, not Oklahoma, but Cincinnati will be in Provo to take on BYU. That's an after 9 o'clock start time, so we start to dip our toes into Big 12 after dark. And then uh, on Sunday, Drew Fan and I will be back with a Sunday show where we will uh, recap the weekend in the league, probably what it says about K-State's chances in a lot of ways, and then also – uh, take a pretty good deep dive into the K-State Oklahoma State game that will be coming up on that Friday. Uh, I know that fan will probably come prepared with tons of great information about why Oklahoma State's defense is laughably bad or offense is laughably bad and, and their defense might suck too if they gave up 34 to Iowa State. So uh, that will do it for us, for Drew and DY. I am Mason. Make sure that you are taking in every piece of content from K-State Online you can to make sure you're up to date with the Cats, whether that's here on the YouTube or on the podcast channels, and certainly over on On3 where you can get great written stuff from Drew and DY or also be uh, reading up on the message boards so you're informed on everything uh, good with K-State and also uh, the the posters will let you know everything bad with K-State. That is for sure. So we are out of here. DY and I back tomorrow for a Friday show.